Good morning and welcome to Vantage Point Online and Happy Easter. In just a second, we're gonna spend some time in worship and celebration together, but I want to stop and encourage you right now to share the link to this live Easter worship service to the people in your community and your groups. You never know what a simple act like sharing a link and inviting someone to join us this morning could mean to someone's life. Let's all do that this morning. I also want to encourage you to participate this morning. We're gonna be singing together. Pastor Mark has an amazing message of hope to share with you this morning. And there's an online host who will be with you during the whole entire time. I'd encourage you to respond with a thumbs up or a heart or laughter if you wanna agree or respond to something you experience. It's just like raising your hand or saying amen or laughing in a normal church service when we're all together. And we're all just learning how to make church feel a little more normal in these crazy times. So as we get started today, why don't you take a second and share the link to this online service and let's see how many people we can get to join us this morning. Thanks for being here. We really hope you enjoy today's Easter worship experience at Vantage Point Online. Our generation is masked with fear and our actions refuse to believe that we will overcome this pandemic. The season of life feels hopeless and we know now that God having a purpose for our lives is not a trustworthy statement. Since we believe in pursuing comfort and security, the next generation will see that holding on to our phones was more important than our Bibles. We will have given up on the fact that our lives will have an eternal impact. And worry will overcome every ounce of our faith. No longer can it be said that we loved and cared for our neighbors. It will be visible that God's people have grown callous to what Jesus did on the cross. It will be crazy to believe that there is hope. How long, O oh God, will you keep your face from us? How long, O oh God, will this virus overcome us? How long will the enemy rejoice over us? find satisfaction in our defeat. But when we think about you, Jesus, how you defeated death, how you conquered sin, how you provided a way so that we may have access to the Father, how your faithfulness has redeemed us how your trustworthiness causes us to rejoice and how your presence, God, has truly flipped the script. And there is hope. And it'll be crazy to believe that God's people have grown callous to what Jesus did on the cross. It will be visible that we loved and cared for our neighbors. And no longer can it be said that worry will overcome every ounce of our faith. And our lives will have an eternal impact. And we will have given up on the fact that holding on to our phones is more important than our Bibles. The next generation will see that pursuing comfort and security is not a trustworthy statement. Since we believe in God having a purpose for our lives. This season of life feels hopeless, and we know now that we will overcome this pandemic. And our actions refuse to believe that our generation is masked with fear. Because our King has risen, and we will rise.
Hey, good morning everybody and happy Easter! You know what, I know that this Easter is a little bit strange because maybe you're not dressed up in your Sunday best, maybe you're not able to get together with your family this Easter, and so in order to retain some kind of normalcy around the Easter, let's do something that our church family does every Easter, and that is the fact that we do something called Pascal's greeting. If you don't know what Pascal's greeting is, I'm gonna say he is risen, and you're gonna respond by saying he is risen, indeed. Guys, we're only going to do it twice. First time's going to be practice, so let's go ahead and practice this, okay? He is risen. Not bad. Not bad. But here's what we're going to do this time. This is the real deal, and so right now let's join our voices with millions of other Christians around the world who are going to be doing the exact same thing. Shout it from the rooftops! He is risen! You know what, next week we're going to be starting a brand new series called How to Survive a Quarantine and Not Kill Each Other. Do you know why we're doing that? Because mama's on the edge. And you know what, baby's on the edge. And you might be on the edge too. And so the Bible has a lot to say about what to do in these close quarters, so would love for you to join us next week. But here's the thing, I love Easter. And part of the reason why I love Easter is I absolutely love the concept of Easter. How is it that 2,000 years later, halfway around the world, that there's somebody in every country of the world that's celebrating the life of a Jewish construction worker from an area that we're not really even all that familiar with? 
How is it that there are half dozen other wannabe messiahs and yet you and I can't even name a one? You and I aren't here today because somebody died on a cross. There were thousands of people that died on the crosses. You and I aren't, also aren't here today because somebody had a really cool blog or they wrote a really cool book or had some really cool wise pithy sayings. Those books have already been written. What you will find is that we are here today because we are celebrating on this weekend the core of everything that we believe as a church. And that is the fact that in the first century there lived a man named Jesus Christ that he claimed to be the Son of God. And then he defended that claim by doing something that only God could do. And that was the fact that he raised himself from the dead. Because of that, now there's an empty tomb to prove it. You know what? Here's something that I also believe. I also believe that you are here watching this today and that this is not an accident. That in your heart of hearts, that you believe that maybe that there is a life that goes beyond this life. And maybe that there's a world that actually goes beyond this world. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. On a scale of one to a hundred, I want you to rate yourself on how good you are. How good of a person are you? Now, I'm gonna give you a little bit of advice here. You're probably not a hundred. There's only one person in the history of the world who would score a hundred. And I got news for you that you are not him. And that's probably not news to you, right? You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. At some point, you've probably driven in church and been like, you, you turned to your kids in the back seat and you were like, shut your mouth. You're going to shut your mouth because in a little bit, we're going to worship Jesus. Um, so we're not perfect. So we're not a hundred, but I got some good news for you that you're probably not a one, you're probably not a two, three, four. That's reserved for ax murders, uh, people who have 227 big cats on their property, uh, anybody who roots for the Houston Astros. If that's you, then maybe you're like a one, two, three, four. So here's, here's the thing, you're probably not a one, you're probably not a hundred, you're somewhere in between. So here's what I want you to do. Are you ready for it? On the count of three, as loud as you can, I want you to shout your number at the TV screen. Okay, here we go. One, two, whoa, whoa, whoa. don't do it, don't do it. I was, I, I was just kidding. You know why? Because if you shout out your number, the person next to you is probably going to look at you and go, you know what? Not even close. But here's the thing. I think this exercise brings up a universal truth. And I think that universal truth brings up a universal question. And that is this right here. How good do you have to be to get to the good place? I mean, if good people go to the good place, and if bad people go to the bad place, well then how good do you have to be in order to get to the good place? So what you're gonna find is that there's somebody in the Bible named the Apostle Paul. He was a follower of Jesus Christ, and he actually had something to say about this. If you have your Bibles, why don't you open up to the book of Romans. Romans chapter three, do you like this little verse that I wrote for myself. Romans chapter 3 verses 19 through 22. Romans chapter 3 verses 19 through 22. It says this right here. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Now, this is just a fancy way of saying that you are under the law and that the law is over you. It's almost kind of like this. If you are an American citizen, then you are under the Constitution and the Constitution is over you. If you are a university student, if you work at a company, there's probably some kind of community standard. There's some kind of code of conduct. And what that means is that the code of conduct is over you and you are under the code of conduct. What the Apostle Paul is saying right here is he is saying that you are under the law of God and that the law of God is 
over you. And in this case, he is specifically talking about the Jewish law in the Old Testament. But here's the thing, even if you're not a Christian, even if you're not a religious person, you are still subject to some kind of law. And for the sake of argument today, we'll just call it the law of your conscience. See, without anybody instructing you, without anybody telling you, there is just this innate sense that is driven with inside all of us of what it is that we should do and what it is that we shouldn't do. And nobody had to teach you that. Nobody had to instruct you that. You just have this natural sense that there's some things in life that you should do. There's some things in life that you shouldn't do. And forget about falling short of the law of God. I mean, for me, I fall short of my own standard. I fall short of my own standard of love. I fall short of my own standard of patience, of kindness, of generosity, of honesty. And here's the thing. I in no way believe that all religions are the same. But at the same time, I believe that almost all religions are almost the same. And what I mean by that is this, whether it be a Native American spirituality, whether it be an ancient Chinese religion, whether it be Judaism or Christianity, what you'll find is that every religion shares at least these eight things in common right here. Number one is do not harm others with word or deed. Number two, honor your parents. Children, are you listening to this? Number three is be kind to your siblings and the elderly. Number four is don't have relations with another person's spouse. Number five is be honest in all of your dealings. Number six is don't lie. Number seven is care for those who are weaker. Number eight is put others First. So here's what I want to ask you. If you've ever violated any of these commands, I want, you to, I want you to participate. I want you to go ahead and raise your hands, okay? So number one, have you ever violated number one? Don't harm others with word or deed. Go ahead and raise your hand if you have. Number two, if you've ever not honored your parents, have you ever broken that one? Go ahead and raise your hand. Number three, have you ever been not kind to your siblings or the elderly? Number four, let's actually not talk about number four, okay? So here's the thing where all religions uh, merge and where all religions are the same. We all believe in those eight things. And here's another thing that all religions believe, that we all believe that we've broken those eight things. But here is where all religions and all philosophies part ways. What do I do once I've broken one of those commands? How do I have my debt forgiven? How do I have my sin excused? How do I become right with God at that point? And what you're gonna find is that every other religion, every other philosophy has a different version of this right here. Well, if you've broken one of those commands, what you need to do is you need to make sure that you do more good things than you do bad things. And if you do more good things, you'll be able to get into the good place. But if you do more bad things, then you're gonna end up going to the bad place. And here's the thing, that sounds really good. And that philosophy sounds really attractive. But the question I wanna ask you is, How good do you have to be in order to get to the good place? Are we talking about a simple majority? Are we talking about 51%? Is that enough to get you in? Are we talking about a passing grade? Do you have to get a 70%? Because where I grew up, a B was an Asian F. Here's another thing. Does God have a different weighting system for different sins? Rape, murder, do those count more than lust, adultery? Here's another thing, when do our sins start counting against us? The elementary years? The teenage years? Because certainly the teenage years can't count against us. If the teenage years count against us, we are in a whole world of hurt at that point. I don't know. 
I don't know how good you have to be. I don't know where the bar is. And in fact, what you're going to find is that I don't even know where I stand in relationship to the bar. I would love it if God had a little app that I could go to and go, oh, okay, during the pandemic, you've been having a lot of angry thoughts and you've been eating too much and your grades gone a little bit lower. But you know what? As long as you do a couple more good things, everything's going to be fine. I don't know where the bar is and I don't know where I stand. The only thing that I really know is that I've got to be good enough, right? I'm looking at those guys over there thinking to myself, I'm better than them. If there's anybody who's going to the good place, it's got to be me. And yet what we find is that the Apostle Paul says something totally different. Because in the next verse, verse 20, he says this right here. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. But rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. What the Apostle Paul is saying is this right here, that we are all under the law. But here's the thing, the reason why we find ourselves under the law is not so that we can be perfect. Rule followers, are you listening to me? In other words, what he's saying is that the point of the rules is not to follow the rules. I mean, that doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, we need rules. Rules are important. But what the Apostle Paul is saying is this, that the ultimate point of following the rules is actually not the keeping of it. I mean, that's almost like saying that the point of following your mother is not to follow your mother. That the point of following your mother is actually so that you would understand that you can never follow your mother. It doesn't make any sense. Have you guys been playing enough board games during this time? Our family, we've actually been playing a game called Pandemic in the pandemic. But here's the thing about me. I hate reading the rules. I just usually take the rules. I give them to my wife, Andrea, and I go, could you read the rules and just explain them to me? But here's the thing, I understand that the rules are important. You need to follow the rules, right? The rules give you instruction on how it is that you're gonna play the game. Not only do the rules instruct you, but the rules also give you a sense of hope on how it is that you're going to win the game. What you're gonna find though, is that God's rules actually do the exact opposite. Because here's the thing, If the point of do not murder is actually that you and I shouldn't even become angry, and if the point of do not commit adultery is actually that you and I shouldn't even lust, then oh my gosh, you and I are in a world of trouble. Because here's the thing, when you understand the law of God correctly, you never see how far you've come You only see how short you fall. And so that's the bad news, right? The good news is what we're about to hear. And here's the thing. This is what every pastor, what every Bible scholar, what every commentator in the world will tell you, that the next verse that we are about to read is actually the most important verse in the entire Bible. And it's this verse right here. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. It says this right here. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. That this righteousness is given through, what? Say it with me, through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Now, in other words, what the Apostle Paul is saying is that there's actually a way to God that goes not through the rules, but actually goes around the rules. And that the way that we actually make our way to God and have a relationship with God is actually through faith in Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul is saying something absolutely amazing here. And he is saying something that no religion, no religious leader, no philosophy has ever espoused. And he is saying this, that he is saying that it's not good people that go to the good place but that it's actually bad people that do. 
what you're going to find is that Jesus says the exact same thing. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was arrested, he was tried, he was beaten, he was mocked, he was nailed to a cross. And he was nailed to a cross right between two different criminals. And with one of those criminals, he decides to have a conversation. And part of that conversation goes like this. Luke chapter 23, verse 42 says this. The criminal says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So I want you to think about this guy for a second. Because he was revolutionary. He was somebody who did whatever he wanted all of his life. And now at the closing minutes of his life, it's too late. He can't make up for all the bad stuff that he's done with some of these good things that he wants to do right as he's nailed to a cross. Dead man talking. There's no way that he's going to be able to make up for lost time. He has lived his life selfishly for whatever he's wanted to do. And now in the closing minutes of his life, he wants to get religion. I mean, that's cute. But look at Jesus' response in verse 43. In verse 43, he says this right here. I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Do you know what that means? Man, that is a revolutionary idea. Because that means that it's not good people that go to the good place. It's actually forgiven people that do. Let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. So Andrea and I have lived in our house for the past 13 years now. And I'm almost bitter about how they get you to buy a house in Eastvale. Because we look at the model home and we're like, oh my gosh, this home is beautiful. But then we walk into our new house and we're like, hey, this looks nothing like the model home. Where are all the fake plants? And after 13 years, what we've realized is that one of the worst things about our house was the carpet. People would come into our house and be like, should we take off our shoes? And we're like, it's actually dirtier inside the house than it is outside the house. So one of the things that we did just a couple months ago is we just had all the carpet changed in our house. The kids would come in, they'd be like, mommy, daddy, I'm bleeding. And we'd be like, uh, could you do that outside? Well, there was one time where Andrea and I went up to the bonus room and we saw marker all over our carpet. And so what do we do at this point? We line up all the kids. We're like, who did this? And so after, after offering a plea deal of two years to life with time off for good behavior, we finally figured out who did it. Judah did it. So I was like, Judah, did you? All over the... And he was like, yes, daddy. And all of a sudden I thought to myself, I mean, what am I going to do at this point with my five-year-old child? Am I going to make him change out the carpet? Am I going to make him pay for the damage? I mean, believe me, I thought about it. But at that point, I did the only thing that a loving father could do. I just bent down and I said, Judah, could you never do that again? And he looked at me and he said, yes, daddy. And he gave me a big old hug. See, here's the thing. God sees your sin as a debt that you just could not pay back. And to ask you to pay that back, to ask you to do a whole bunch of good things in order to make up for the bad, that's almost like me asking my five-year-old son to do something about the carpet. I mean, he could try, but it would never look good enough. And so God decided in that moment that when we treated him unfairly, that God was going to be extravagantly unfair back to us. That he gave his son to come to this earth, to live a perfect life, to die on a cross, to pay for our penalty, so that if we would believe in him, that we would never perish but have everlasting life. And maybe that's what you need to do today. Maybe you need to finally give up on the idea that you know that, that it's my good deeds that are going to get me to the good place. But maybe today for the first time, you're going to ask forgiveness for all the things that you've done. 
you're going to come back to God as your heavenly father and say, I know that you died, you rose again for me. And today, I want to invite you into my life. If that's you today, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me right now. Why don't we all bow our heads and pray this prayer? Father God, we just want to thank you, Lord, for this Easter Sunday that we believe at the heart, in our heart of hearts that you came to this world to die on a cross. And that, Father, that, that, that you validated your claim as the Son of God by leaving that tomb empty. And because that tomb is empty today, we know that you have defeated death, you have defeated hell, that you have defeated the grave. And, Father, it is our heartfelt commitment that we believe in you. We place our life in your hands. We place our heart with you. And we just want to say for the first time, Heavenly Father, that we love you with all of our heart. We want to follow you, God. We love you, Lord. We want to be able to walk in your footsteps and live a life that is worthy of you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.
Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed your promise. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me. Thanks for joining us at Vantage Point Online today for Easter Sunday services. Now, if you did receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning, please let us know by going to our website at vantagepointchurch.org slash live. Or you can let us know right here live in the comments. We'd love to celebrate with you and get some information to you that will help you on your new journey. You'll also find some awesome stuff for your kids and a place to let us know how we can pray for you. And like never before, we are committed to being living proof of a loving God to the people around us. We have so many opportunities in the midst of this pandemic crisis to reach out to those who are hurting around us, to show them how much God loves them. And thanks to your faithful giving and willingness to serve during this time, we are continuing to make a difference in our community. Now, if you wanna join our efforts to make a difference, go to our website at vantagepointchurch.org and click on the COVID-19 response team button where you'll be able to sign up to be on our COVID-19 living proof response team, our triage team, our prayer team, or even learn how you can help people in need of crisis counseling walk through these next crazy months without being alone. And of course, if we can help you in any of these ways, please click on the I need help button and we will contact you right away to see how we can be there for you and your family. Of course, we can't do any of these things without your continued faithful giving. And we are so thankful that even in these uncertain times, so many of you are stepping up to the plate to allow us to continue to be living proof to the people around us. Thank you for your continued faithfulness and support. And for those of you who do not currently give online, we want to encourage you to begin that today. There are several easy ways for you to do that. Number one, you can sign up to give on our website, vantagepointchurch.org give. Just click on give here, enter the amount you wanna give and select the fund you want to give to. You can even choose to make your gift recurring so you can easily give automatically each month. And then just fill out your personal and payment information and you are good to go. There are other ways to give, such as our app, through texting, giving online through our bank, uh, through your bank, or sending your check to our mailing address. And please remember, in addition to giving to the General Ministry Fund, we are continuing to raise money through the MOVE initiative for the ongoing construction of our new church campus. And whether you've been faithfully giving to MOVE or you're starting right now, your generosity is helping us get to our new home as quickly as possible. So thanks for joining us this morning. We hope this Easter was a special one for you and your family. And we'll see you next week right back here at Vantage Point Online. Have a great week.